Welcome to the Lover's Hole. You're with Mike and Ian. And we are rereading Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey Maturin Cannon, those books that we all love so much. We are in the middle of Nutmeg of Consolation. And Ian, if you'd be so kind to bring us up to date. It would be my pleasure, Mike. Let's see now. Last time, there was a bit of corruption in the air as Jack helped get the nutmeg ready for C, equipped with carronades. Remember the carronades equipped to fight the Cornelie. Raffles had helped Jack to find a clerk slash secretary slash purser. This is Mr. Adams and also two potential midshipmen. Stephen and Jack had had a fun farewell dinner with the governor and Mrs. Raffles and also some Dutch ladies. But in waiting for the dinner, Jack had lost his breeze and he couldn't make headway against the tides. After what turns out to be perhaps an overly enthusiastic wish for wind at church, they went through a significant gale. Ha! Ah, even so, Miller, Oaks and Conway from the foretop were promoted to midshipmen in this lovely little leadership turn that Jack pulled here. Jack has cracked on his concern that they had lost too much time to intercept the Cornelie, which is where we left them at the end of last time. This time, Mike, the cracking on continues as the nutmeg searches for the Cornelie. Information from a Dutch merchantman causes them to never say die. Stephen is plagued by dentistry, by relative poverty, and by moral advantage, just like the rest of us. Yeah. Um, their beautiful restored nutmeg turns ugly and Jack's classic capers begin. Mike, it's an it's a episode with some throwbacks to some good old Jack Aubrey doings that we've loved for a long time here. It, it really is. O'Brien opens chapter five with, with what I thought was one great sentence. He writes, Miller, the uglier of the two resurrected midshipmen, had been commended for his piercing eyesight and his diligence as a lookout not only by Mr. Richardson, his divisional officer, but by the captain himself. And now he could scarcely be prized from the masthead. So I thought, oh, what a, what a great way to start this action here. So this, you know, this young Miller, oh, <laughs> is a brain run, the uglier here, yeah. he's had this great respect for Jack anyway. Jack has this great natural authority. He's got this reputation as a fighting commander and a captain. And, and he, of course, has the power to promote and demote, as Miller well knows. But this respect, O'Brien tells us, has become an enthusiastic veneration. And that's because Miller is, is watching this cracking on and he's thinking, you know, I've never seen anything like this at my years at sea. And, and then he's talking to some shipmates who've had decades, decades more experience. And they go, yeah, us either. You know, haven't seen it either. And, and Miller decides that with this veneration for Jack, he wants to be the one who spots the Cornelie yeah. when they actually do that. So whether he's on duty or not, he is up. In the mass, you know, looking out, even when there's official lookout there, he's, just, you know, I'm going to find this one. He's eating his meals up there. He, he actually uh, has this telescope with him that that young Reed gave him. You know, I love this. Reed says, you know, it's no use to a one arm cove, you know, but you shall treat Harper and me to a bold punch when we reach Botany Bay. So obviously <laughs> Reed has welcomed Miller into the midshipman's berth here. And Miller is he's starting to get on the nerve of the lookouts a little bit. You know, he's calling out all these proas that he sees with what O'Brien calls a non-committal howl. But for the last three days, he's seen nothing, not even a horizon. And then there's, there's this brief clearing of the mist, and he hails the quarter deck. He says, on deck there, a ship hull up on the larboard quarter steering southeast. And he immediately feels the rigging moving as Jack comes you know, flying up underneath them here. Jack's looking, you know, finally the ship reappears through the mist. And, and Jack knows in his heart, he's like, you know, he's getting all excited. He says, you know, it's going southeast. This can't be her. It's not the French, but whoever it is, we're going to intercept her. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? It's, a, it's an exciting moment. And Mike, for any other author writing any other kind of seagoing tale, this would be opening chapter one. Right, like, yeah. Right. Look out! Spots a ship on deck. It's a you know, it's a Frenchman hull up, and you know, beat to quarters. This is like yeah, this. This would be the opening scene of the Master and Commander movie, of which we'll come to some more later on. But no, we're, we're five chapters in, and now we get this little opening bit of action here. For all the excitement, for all the anticipation of Miller and everybody else, we're going to be let down. 
It turns out that she's a Dutch merchantman, the ship called the Alkmaar, and her papers are in perfectly proper order when they're brought over by the master. And again, this is a little moment that we've seen before. Jack welcomes these merchant men aboard with hospitality and plies them with drink and scrapes them for some intelligence. Right. Madeira is what he offers on this occasion, but the master of this ship asks for water, water for him and water for the ship, because he's really, really short. They've been on you know, short water rations for a while now. Doesn't even think he'll get to his next harbour. Jack says, well, I'll provide you with some water, but how do you come to speak English so well? And in just a few sentences here, Mike, we get this lovely little vignette of the character of the master of this Dutch ship. He'd been pressed into the English service a while ago before the peace. He'd served in herring buses, Dutch and English before that. And then the question arises from Jack, how come you got so short of water? Well, this is another heart back to a situation that we know Jack and his crew have been in on other occasions. They'd been escaping. In this case, they'd been escaping from pirate junks before being stopped by, dramatic pause, a French 32-gun frigate. <gasps> ah, here we go. It turns out that the French 32-gun frigate was short of water too. The French had been nice to the master of the Alkmaar. They'd only taken all of his gunpowder, four full barrels of best manila large grain. They'd taken their sailcloth, but didn't take the remaining water since the master had showed them a good watering place. Mike, I'm remembering here that we associate the Cornelie with some of Jack's old buddies on the French service side. And there's this kind of gentility. These are not kind of black-hearted villain enemy you know, ruthless people. These are people with a bit of humanity and a bit of heart. Huh. It turns out that the watering place is called Nil Desperandum, and it's close by. We, we, we should come back to Nil Desperandum. That's a phrase pregnant with possibility there, Mike. It turns out that this place offers only slow watering. We learned that Nil Desperandum as a watering place is a, a winding passage to get up to it. And when you get there, a small stream with no basin, but it had worked for the French since they were bound for the Sulababu Passage anyway. The master says he couldn't use it for his ship because he'd have to beat back this way, back in the direction that he's now heading. So Jack's learned about this little prime opportunity here. He learns some more about the French frigate, about her crew and qualities before sending the master back with the promise of water delivered by our fire hose. And on another occasion, it might have been Madeira delivered by a fire hose, but this time it's water. Right. I, I love how, you know, Jack says, look, you know, I'll, I'll give you water and I'll give you ship water, but go ahead and drink your Madeira anyway. You can yeah, have exactly. some, right? <laughs> What a good guy. Oh, well, Fielding, you know, has a really tough time watering the Dutch ship. The, the hose turns out to be too short and neither his crew on the nutmeg nor the Dutch crew are, you know, really minding the paintwork very much as they're trying, you know, supposedly booming each other off. Uh, Jack is in a tearing hurry. He keeps saying, you know, there's not a minute to lose, not a minute to lose. And, and O'Brien writes that Fielding's spirits were so ruffled that he kicked a ship's boy for pulling off loose ribbons of paint on the black straight. And, and right after he does it, you know, he's called to the captain's cabin and he's worried. He's like, oh, no, you know, this I, I kicked the ship's boy. Uh, O'Brien says he knew very well that Captain Aubrey disliked starting with a rope's end or a cane kicking, cobbing, and even reproachful words such as lover or damn your infernal limbs, unless they were uttered by himself. So is a, here we go, you know, fielding a little worried, heading for the cabin. Oh, it's, it's a nightmare scenario for a first lieutenant. You know, the, the, the captain wants to put the ship in danger, and you're thinking, oh, all my precious bits of housekeeping that I've done. <sighs> it, back in the cabin then with the master, Stephen and Jack are looking over a chart. And we get to explore place names. We know that O'Brien loves to drop in a bit of a place name. Jack turns to Fielding and asks if he knows what nil desperando means. Fielding doesn't, and we'll dig some more into that for ourselves in a couple of seconds. Jack gives his own immediate translation. He says, it means never say die or luck may turn yet. It's the name of an island about 300 miles to leeward just before the passage. So remember, if they're going to be chasing the Cornelie, then that's the direction that they'll be headed. Fielding had said that, well, I thought it was elsewhere. And they get into this little chat here about the number of islands with the same names in those parts. And Jack mentions in passing the many desolation islands and the many nil desperandums. And he tells them he hopes to find the Cornelie watering at this 
Neil Desperandum, and he hopes to get as close as possible by looking like a merchantman. Little Jack Aubrey echo from a, a few occasions in the past here. Jack says, Fielding no longer has to worry about the paintwork. Ha 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 ha. Like Fielding's <laughs> ever going to stop worrying about the paintwork. He's going to make the nutmeg look like the Alkmaar. And Stephen recalls another particular occasion when they'd done this. He says that there were, we, we made the deer surprise into what he called a vile mud scow to deceive the Spartan. Turds everywhere. And I can just imagine Fielding's face at the idea of, you know, turds everywhere aboard his precious nutmeg. Right. Fielding who has taken really, really great pains to make the nutmeg fit for an admiral's inspection, is looking very concerned. Jack says, don't, don't worry, the, the filth does not have to be fundamental. They only need to look like a merchantman until they're within carronade range. And my, I don't think Fielding is going to buy any of this. But before we get into the filth and the mud scow and the turds, let's talk a little bit about nil desperandum. That sounds like it must have a bit of, uh, a bit of digging behind it. Yeah, it's it's a great phrase. It, it comes originally from one of Horace's odes. So, you know, it's a, it's a Patrick O'Brien go-to. Horace, we've been there before. And the line that it comes from, Ode 1.7 there, no need to despair with Tusser as your leader. It's kind of nice. Now, this line has resonated, uh, you know, all over the world here. As a matter of fact, as a Floridian, you know, Tom Petty's one of our great rock and roll stars. Yay. And <laughs> Tom Petty's funeral, one of his younger daughters actually had Tom Petty T-shirts made that said Neil Desperandum on there with a picture of Tom Petty. So, you know, no need to despair here. And maybe we can pop that out as a social media post later. It's yeah, also right. the basis of a slightly changed line spoken by Rhett Butler in Gone with the Wind. And, huh. and sadly, Scarlett didn't quite get it. She, by the end of the novel, she does, but not then. And, and even in Horace's original in the ode, we've got this son of Troy who's been kind of disowned. He's pulled his own band of loyal men together. And they're, you know, he calls them my gallant crew. And, and he's sort of saying, you know, you know, don't worry about anything. There's no need to despair. He says, no need to worry. I'm leading you. He says, you know, arise hearts that have borne with me worst buffets. Drown today in wine your care. Tomorrow we recross the wide, wide sea. So I thought even, oh. even this ode has got this great Jack Aubrey, this crew that loves him, you know, uh, this whole way the chapter opened, you know, with this veneration for their leader. So great little phrase. Thank you, O'Brien. And, and this idea of uh, Neil Desbrandum has, has cropped up in other more kind of contemporary, less, uh, less refined references to Latin, right, Mike? Oh, it, it has. <laughs> I actually used to uh, have a sign on my desk in years, years and years, decades and decades ago. Neil Desperandum. Now, you know, I'll, I'll murder this here. I should probably get you to do it here, but we'll try it. Illegitimate non carborandum. Uh, what it, you know, trying to say is it's, it's mock Latin. It's not real Latin. So I guess there's there, no real pronunciation there. The last phrase, it's... Don't let the bastards grind you down. In 1943, <laughs> it became kind of part of Harvard's unofficial school song. Barry Goldwater in his presidential campaign had it. It actually came up out of British military intelligence in World War II. And one of the American generals had it as a motto there with this, you know, don't let the bastards grind you down. And as it turns out, you know, it was, you know, I've, I've had that sign for so many years. And, and now I find out that it's not real Latin. It's mock Latin. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, still, everybody knows what it means when they read it, right? It's close enough. Too it's true. Yeah, like really everybody except for my two bosses, who I was reminding <laughs> myself not to worry about. They they never got it, never asked. But ah, there, there you scholarly go. Scholarly types. Very right. good. Well, so, speaking of grinding, I'm going to try and make a very, very tenuous link to the next part here. Um, <laughs> Steve, Stephen's making his rounds, and Stephen's nightmare continues. So Fielding's having a nightmare with the paintwork. Stephen's having a nightmare because we're headed into the one corner of physical and medical practice where Stephen's not at his most comfortable. There are two dental cases. Both Stephen and Macmillan are, are concerned. Neither of them is great at dental work. After they were done with these badly decayed molars, Stephen, it turns out, had turned even paler than the men he'd treated. 
And he mentions to Jack, he says, I have no problem taking off a limb, opening a skull, delivering a breech birth, but I get highly agitated drawing a tooth. And he says, I'm never, ever going to sail again without a good tooth drawer. Mike, I've got a recollection that some way back in the beginning of the far side of the world, when they got O'Higgins aboard, uh, he, was, he was there as a tooth drawer, among other things. But that, that was a whole other storyline that that started. Anyway, even an illiterate tooth drawer would be better than none at all, Stephen's thinking. So Jack suggests maybe to sustain his friend's spirits here, says just having a cup of coffee. And O'Brien points out that coffee is Jack's universal remedy, just as much as the tincture of opium used to be Stephen's. And we also get this little reflection on how Stephen is glad that he hadn't chewed the coca leaves that he'd promised himself when he'd finished in the sick berth, because that would have taken away the excellent taste of the coffee. So Stephen says, I'm going to set aside the coca leaves. I'll chew them later. For now, I'm going to drink coffee until the pot is empty. Now, Stephen notes, Stephen, the all-wise seaman and mariner, right? Stephen notes that the ship must be going uncommon fast because he notices that the water is being flung wide. He notices that they have to raise their voices to speak. And the ship's sound, he says, is just like the note G that Jack's thumb is plucking on his violin. Ah, nice little musical uh, connection there. Reed comes in with Richardson's message that the ship is doing 12 knots, one fathom. And Mike, 12 knots is plenty. 12 knots is a really, really creditable speed, especially for a fairly round, short little ship. Um, Reed, he says, has chalked it up himself. Jack is really glad to hear this, asks Reed to let Richardson know that he may set a skyscraper on the foremast if he sees fit, which is, like you said, Mike, more cracking on here. Right. Reed says Richardson wants the doctor to know that there is a prodigious curious bird keeping company very like an albatross with somewhat in its beak Stephen runs up on deck just as the bird finally disengages what it had in its beak it was a cuttlefish bone and after it disengaged this and got rid of this bone stuck in its beak it flies away um, Stephen thanks Richardson for showing him the bird and in return Richardson lines Stephen up so that he can see the setting of this skyscraper that's going to be set flying so set not on a on a yard or a spa but just by by its corners coming back into the cabin Stephen gives his thoughts on this bird he thinks it might have been a smaller albatross and he thinks that it was carrying a detached cuttlebone impelled on its beak and that the bird might have carried this bone for a thousand miles I might that there's got to be a reason here why O'Brien chose this particular bone and this particular bird, right? Yeah, it, it's fascinating. Like you say, and he doesn't just drop these in for no reason here. Uh -huh. And sure enough, we find that this bone in the cuttlefish is what distinguishes it from a squid. That, you know, it has this bone, which squids don't. And this bone is very unique. It's, it's kind of an internal shell, but that shell is used to regulate its buoyancy, that it can actually change the gas to liquid ratio inside the porous chambers of this bone to move up and down. Uh, so cuttlefish like, you know, like octopus and some of the other of that ilk uh, release ink to create a smoke screen to distract predators, sometimes to hide their escape, sometimes they can actually release ink in a form that looks like a decoy of themselves. So while the, you know, while the predator is going after the, the ink decoy, it makes its way out of there. There's even some discussion that the possibility that uh, they can use the chemistry uh, of this decoy to also sort of be like sensory, like, you know, wow, appeal wow. to their food senses. So fascinating. Masters of disguise. Turns out that there's a lot more males than females. <laughs> like like a Patrick O'Brien novel, you might say. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so they're always thinking of ways that, you know, you've got this great big cuttlefish protecting a female or females. And, and these smaller guys are trying to figure out how to get around them. So I talked about master of disguise. They can actually disguise themselves, change their color, use some of this ink, use some of the other things to make themselves look like females carrying egg sacs. And so, you know, they're allowed past the big guard cuttlefish, the male, and, and they're back behind them, you know, having a good time with their new mates back there. So, this this kind of interesting thing we know that an albatross rhyme of the ancient mariner we've talked about this before yeah. all right always pretends to be some omen for seagoers and now albatross caught with a cuttlefish bone this master of disguise 
all of a sudden the master of disguise bone has been tossed away. That's been carried for like a thousand miles. What, what does this mean that it's dropped now, just as the nutmeg heads disguising itself, looking for the French frigate here? I don't know, but I'm sure O'Brien has us scratching our heads for good oh, reason. Oh, I'm sure he does. It's a really, really great illusion to dig into. Thanks, Mike. That's great. Yeah. Stephen then, wondering what kind of albatross it might have been, reflects that he might have had to shoot it to know for sure, but he's tired of killing. And Mike, we, we've had this coming back from Stephen ever since even before he went up to the temple in Kumai, right? He's in his in his zone where he wants to just appreciate the nature around him and not get involved in killing it. Made an exception for emergency food on the island earlier on, but he's not interested in killing for sport or killing for science. He notes now that the haze that we had on the horizon before is clear. The horizon is now visible. Jack says it cleared overnight and that they had confirmed their ship's position with excellent observations matching their dead reckoning. So they're able to use all of Jack's astro-navigation chops here to get their position pinpointed. This is going to turn out to be important. He's really pleased with his feet, but realizes that this doesn't mean anything at all. He doesn't realize all the complexity that, that Jack is using in these calculations, doesn't realize all the science and the knowledge that it's all stood on. Stephen just takes it all as red and a part of Jack's uh, toolkit here. So realizing that he's not going to get Stephen to, to be wowed by this, he invites him to resume their musical game, recalling that he, Jack, had been winning when they left off. Stephen says that Jack's aging memory betrays him if he thinks he was winning. <laughs> yeah, okay. The banter is coming back here. And as they tune up, Mike, we, we get a little Russell Crowe alert. We get a little hark back to something that actually appeared as part of the script for the Master and Commander movie. Killick turns to his mate and complains, there they are, at it again, squeak, squeak, boom, boom. And when they do start a playing, it's no better. You can't tell t'other from one. Never nothing a man could sing to, even drunk as Davy's sow. That's what we get in the movie, Mike. But we get this really nice follow-on in the conversation between Killick and his mate, William Grimshaw. I remember them in the lively, says Grimshaw, but it's not as chronic as a wardroom full of gents with German flutes, belly aching night and day like we had in the Thunderer. No, live and let live, I say. <laughs> and Mike, we might all be remembering in the last chapter, we had this nice dialogue between Killick and Grimshaw and the button on it was, God love you, William Grimshaw. And I love how this time the button on this conversation, Killick turns around and says, yeah, fuck you, William Grimshaw. <laughs> you really have to be pretty good mates to go from, from you know, God love you to this. And, yeah. and, and it's all part and parcel of a natural conversation, right? Uh, it's great. It's great. Killick and Grimshaw. Again, Grimshaw is, is just being painted in a few lines of dialogue here. Is this really an interesting, rich secondary character. It's fabulous. Once again, we have to apologize to all the German flute players out there in our audience, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. At some point, we'll have to have a fake Twitter account for German flute players so they can have their own, you know, have their own moment in the sun. I love it. This musical game, as it turned out, was that one of them should improvise in the manner of some eminent composer or as nearly as indifferent skill and a want of inspiration allowed and that the other, having detected the composer, should then join in, accompanying him with a suitable continuo, and until some given point understood by both, when the second should take over, either with the same composer or with another. They both enjoy it, and they play well into the darkness, pausing only for Jack to take his Humboldt readings at the end of the first dog watch. They're still playing later on when Killick opens the door on the moonlit cabin and announces dinner. It's a very good meal. We have some specialties on board who, that were gifts from Mrs. Raffles. They drink their usual toasts. And with the last of the wine, Jack raises his glass and says, to the dear surprise, and may we meet her soon. And just like any good podcaster, Stephen replies to this, with all my heart, and drains his glass. And Jack suggests that Stephen should sleep below since Jack is taking the middle watch and it's going to be in and out. So pretty soon they're going to have to gut the cabin and bring the chasers aft, of which more later. And Mike, I, I just want to mention that this musical game is pretty advanced. This is jazz skill rather than classical music skill. Once again, I think that 18th century music played the role in that time that jazz plays in the 20th century or played in the 20th century. Improvising in the style of a composer back and forth, that's pretty advanced stuff. One of my favorite classical music YouTube channels is Two Set Violin. And if any of you like this kind of stuff, and you like kind of comedy musical turns, check out Two Set Violin on YouTube. Really, really talented guys. 
very, very clever parlor games that they play. They haven't ever played this one because I think this would be a bit of a stretch, but take a look. Oh, nice. We might have to put them out on social media and tag them and, and suggest yeah, yeah. it with the quote. <laughs> see them throw that up. That would be great. Well done. I've, I've written that down myself, man. I can't wait to see that. Oh, well, you know, Stephen does head down to his little cabin off the gun room and, and he's laying there awake in his hammock. You know, O'Brien tells us that that the coffee and the cocoa leaves have, have outweighed the port. So you know, <laughs> chemical balance is still to the plus action side here. Uh, he's listening to the usual ship's noises through the night. He's thinking about this remote possibility of meeting the surprise at the end of the Salababu Passage. And he has this clear mental image of the surprise. But, you know, as he's thinking of her, it all of a sudden brings to his mind this idea that he's lost his fortune. And, you know, uh-huh. he's got this present relative poverty. He, he may own the surprise, but he's never going to have these splendid cruises that he promised himself that, you know, after the war's over, you know, Martin and I are going to be off to islands nobody's ever been on. Uh, nobody's going to be able to tell me there's not a moment to lose. And, you know, we'll be exploring like these places where you can pick up the birds by hand and put them right back down on their nest. And then he started, as you do sometimes laying awake, you know, thinking of all the things that he's not going to be able to do because of this change in circumstances here. You know, no endowed university chairs, selling the house in Half Moon Street. But then he remembers, well, you know, I, I, I did set up a few annuities and I've got my service pay. So hopefully we'll be able to keep Diana's new place in Hampshire for her Arabian horses and uh, yeah. you know, I, I can say, Stephen, yeah, if you're thinking about keeping a farm full of Arabian horses, you're certainly only relatively poor. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think many things in Stephen's life are going to be OK. <laughs> this right. his worries. Well, Stephen knows then that Diana will take it well, even if they had to move back to what he remembers as his half ruined castle in the mountains of Catalonia. His worry then is not about absolutely being homeless, but about what Diana might choose to do in response to this. He's worried that she might sell the Blue Peter, this great diamond, the joy of her life. He's worried that this would not only take away that joy, but it would give her an immense moral advantage. And we're going to dig into this here. There's a little bit of marital philosophy being espoused here by Patrick O'Brien. It says Stephen was convinced that moral advantage was a great enemy to marriage. Few happy marriages did he know among his friends and acquaintance. And in those few, the balance seemed to him equal. And then again, he found it more blessed to give than to receive. He had a strong disinclination to being obliged. And sometimes when he was low spirited, he put this down to an odious incapacity for gratitude. Wow. This is really deep. I mean, uh, earlier on in the canon, we've had Stephen reflecting on his and Diana's reflective capacity or incapacity for love. And he's going back to that same kind of dark tone here. Am am I genuinely incapable of being grateful? And what does that mean for me as a spouse and me as a person in life? Yeah, it is so much in mindfulness, in kind of the positive uh, happiness sort of literature now about gratitude and how important that is. And, and, and it is, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating you know, we'll, we'll come back and have to talk about this a little bit more, but it is fascinating to think Stephen, who is such a giving person, and he says, more blessed to give than receive, you know, realizing in himself, yeah, but I don't like when people are giving for me. You know, I don't like being the patient. I don't like being the person that's being given to, right? right. Well, you know, it turns out that there's, there's kind of some history here for Stephen. He thinks back to his childhood after his parents' death when he was very young, And he'd been moved around from, you know, kind of one relative to another, living with these family members in Spain before finally kind of finding his true home with his godfather, Don Ramon, who we've, you know, we've heard about before. Well, there were these two cousins of his that were married and, and, uh, you know, he stayed with them as a child. He stayed with them as an adolescent. He stayed with them as an adult. And he's thinking about kind of watching their relationship over the years. When they were first married, they were very fond of one another although they, they were still kind of very strict and severe in their piety. You know, they went to early morning mass in an icy cold cathedral every morning. But again, very fond of each other. He comes back as an adolescent and, you know, he thinks to himself, well, the only apparent fondness he saw in O'Brien's words were forms of unselfishness and deference to the other's will 
And at this third, this third stay as a young man, when he comes back as a young man, it was quite clear to him that what fondness there may have been had been eaten away by a struggle for moral superiority. You know, they each wanted to be better than the other, have that moral advantage. O'Brien writes, their life had become a competitive martyrdom, competitive fasting, competitive holiness, competitive fortitude and self-denial, a dreadful, uncomplaining cheerfulness in that ancient, cold, damp, stony house, an intensely watchful competition that could only be won by the cousin that died first. First, and, and the woman actually told Stephen as a secret, which Stephen was never to tell, that whenever Don Ramon gave her a present or gave her her dress allowance for the last three years, she had always taken that money and instead of using it for herself, used it for prayers and masses for her husband's spiritual welfare. This is not her. This is all me. But you can almost hear the subtext, you know, the bastard. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, no, I'm better than you are. No, I'm better than you are. Oh, well, I'm secretly doing that. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, Stephen's final thought is this. It was not that he thought Diana would profit from her advantage in any way or even be aware that she had one. That was not her style at all. It was rather that he, he, Stephen, with his fundamentally rather inferior character, should be oppressed by her generosity. Like you say, Ian, this is, boy, this is, this is heavy stuff. I think this is why people write in the New York Times, the Washington Post reviews back in the 90s. This is like the best historical fiction in the world. This is the human condition. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I, and I think it's got a bit of character for Stephen in it as well. Yes. By the way, we, we had a great question on Twitter from uh, listener Peter Nickel. Hello, Peter, if you're listening. Peter wrote to us on Twitter via at Whole Lubbers, which you can too. You can also contact us on Facebook at The Lubbers Hole. Peter wrote on Twitter, would love to hear your thoughts on O'Brien's frequent mention of the pitfalls of one partner in a relationship holding the moral high ground as damaging to both. In my experience, it's best never to keep score but there is something to his premise. Mike, I'd, l- I'd love to hear what you think about this. I'm, I'm going to take another angle on this. F- for me, remembering my experience in my life and people that I've encountered, this has a strong whiff of Catholicism about it. Oh. Um, and, and I think the way not only people in a relationship, but people in the Catholic faith generally are, are often wrongly, I think, believe that their faith just means looking for ways to sort of abnegate themselves. And... I can think of people that I've known who are really good at this <laughs> and c- competing for moral advantage. And I think it goes along with some of the culture that I've, that I've seen and encountered in some Catholic families. Um, interestingly, at various points in their lives, Patrick O'Brien and Mary were more or less practicing Catholics. They would have to have been if they'd been attending regular church in Collier anyway. And there are connections in their family with the Russian Orthodox faith as well, which is, has mm. you know, lots of cultural and ritual overlaps with the Catholic church. So I, I, I smell a bit of a, uh, a, a faith connection here. What about you, Mike? Well, it lives on beyond the Catholic Church. You know, Calvinism certainly had a lot of this. The Puritans certainly, oh my gosh. Does it? Uh, oh my gosh. Well, that, that's the end of my plans to become a Calvinist then. Oh, right, right. <laughs> and even the Quakers, who I love, there's the old joke about, well, brother, all have fallen short of God except for me and thee. You know, they've, they've <laughs> sinned except for me and thee. And sometimes I worry about thee, brother. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, but I think it's so true. I, I love the question there that Peter asked. And, you know, he said, in my experience, it's best never to keep score. And I want to say, yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, yeah, it yeah. is absolutely best never to keep score. Unless, uh, let's pick a big caveat. If you're being abused physically, yeah, emotionally. Yeah. yeah, hey, look. Yeah, you know, don't, don't take in what we're talking about here. That's a get out situation. But coming back to that saying, you know, think about the stories that we tell ourselves, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, how we've been slighted or we're not appreciated for all that we do or how we're not as good or worthy or lovable or forgivable or as the way we do this judging stuff. I mean, of ourselves, of others in the relationship If we could not keep score, again, short of those absolutes that you want to say, you know, you need to pay attention and get out of this. This is not healthy. You know, it would be so much. And it's it's like a negative spiral. You know, we need to turn that around because we can't have that positive spiral. I mean, you know, I was so struck 
thinking about this with Stephen and Diana and remembering against, again, how Diana came to part with the Blue Peter. You yeah, know, it was yeah. to save Stephen's life. I mean, you know, this <laughs> Diana, who sometimes we see as cold and remote and perhaps a little bit caring about society and money and stuff like that. And I love that Stephen realizes, look, you know what? She'd even go back to the half ruined castle and she'd be okay with it. You know, yeah, and so yeah. I think, gosh, they've come a long way in seeing this. They, he saw her in Sweden about how she was. And, you know, I want to say, so Stephen, it's time to ask yourself, what's the story you're telling yourself? Yeah, you know, yeah. what's your part in this? That's so that's me with decades of therapy talking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was always easy for me to kind of see because some of my, you know, what's my part in this was so egregious. But what's harder to say, why, what's driving that? And yeah. gosh, that's, that's the work of our lives sometimes to free ourselves and our friends and our, you know, our deepest loved ones from these kinds of things. Yeah. And, and, and poor old Stephen, I think it's one of the things that keeps our interest and our empathy with his character going. He's, he's nowhere, n- nowhere near free. Right. Um, and for right. all the great progress he makes with himself and with his struggles against the, the military foes that he has and the espionage foes and for all his success in building a relationship with Diana, he's still not free from this self-doubt and free from all of this kind of turmoil inside him. Yeah. And uh, that's what keeps us fascinated because you know, we're talking about a chapter of literature here where we know half of what's going to happen. We've, we've said how, how, how we recognize all the little turns and the moments and the, and the tropes that are lovably familiar patrick o'brien but the thing that's really keeping us going is will Stephen ever ever get self-aware completely and will he ever be free from all of this self-doubt poor guy well and and, and to your point it, it's and it's watching him it's watching jack along the way yep. it's watching them with each other i mean i'm thinking about you know and we'll see well you know let me let me bite my tongue here because we'll see some of this coming up you know how did how did Stephen treat Jack when Jack was in Pauper's well and was actually in Pauper's jail, you yeah, know, yeah. again, and how would Jack treat Stephen now that Stephen seems to be perhaps where Jack once was? I think the the good thing to remind ourselves is there's a there's a reason it's called the moral high ground. It's not that we want to have the immoral high ground, but it, it's <laughs> kind of say, you know what, this is wrapped in morality. Morality fundamentally is about love. And when we love, you know, we, we take away some of that. There's, there's, you know, there shouldn't be a high ground in love. You know, I mean, yeah. Mike, and, and anybody looking at the tide table is going to be admiring you right now. I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. So Mike, if we're going to reflect on high ground and reflect on the moral version of that, and we're going to reflect on Stephen and reflect on marriage, I think there's a lot to reflect on. Maybe we could all just step back and grab ourselves a bottle of Madeira. And we'll come back and rejoin Jack and Stephen and their ponderings and their morality right after this short break. All right. (laughs) If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. So welcome back. I hope that your moral advantage is on an even keel, just as it would have been before. And I hope that you had a great break. We're back with Stephen. And he hears six bells being rung. And Stephen, again, the the rather dislocated and distracted mariner, wonders what watch they're in. Apart from the fact that it being six bells, he's already ruled out two of the possible watches. But never mind. Never mind. He notes that the ship seems to be moving even faster. Faster again than he'd already noticed before. The sound, he thinks, has risen half a note. So it's G-sharp. His mind turns to what he calls his probable, almost certain daughter. Now, little more than a larva, with virtually no conversation, but with such potentialities. A Mozart string quartet began singing in his head. And Mike, I love that juxtaposition from love and possibility and a child to music. I'd say that's a really, really great compliment to Mozart string quartets. Not that they're not worth it. Ah. As he's listening to the Mozart string quartet, he also hears a voice in his head. And this is a more terrestrial voice and a more everyday voice saying, if you please, sir, timed to an irregular movement of his cot. And he turns to accuse Conway and says to Conway, you've been shaking my cot. And Conway says, yes, I was. Captain's compliments. Hopes he has not been much disturbed. 
invites him to breakfast. So now we know which six bells it is. It's in the morning watch. And Stephen is very happy to join him. Jack, in turn, is happy to see him and says that he thought Stephen would be amazed. And this time, with the sight in front of him, Stephen truly is amazed. The entire cabin, we learn, is bare apart from two chairs. There's the breakfast table and the nine pound chasers far away, hard up against the stern port lids. They've made a clean sweep overnight and everything else is gone except the guns. There are the tools and accessories that go with the guns. We've got the garlands of shot, the wads, the rammers and the worms. But that's it. It's a completely military setup here. The smell of coffee and of frying bacon are the only things left in the cabin that are familiar to Stephen. And remember, this is the first time he's seen the nutmeg cleared for action. It's not like the surprise that he's seen cleared for action dozens and dozens of times. Jack says he hasn't invited anyone else. They're too filthy from making the ship into an abomination. And I think all the way along here, Jack is really enjoying the fact that he's asking Fielding, the slightly prissy, slightly housewifey first lieutenant, to make filth and, uh, and, and mess and slovenliness in all directions. Stephen thanks Jack for waiting to have breakfast with him. Jack says, well, I'm surprised that you slept. We had trundling the chasers aft. That would have made a din. They would have been beating the port lids open that had been basically soaked and then painted shut from the nutmeg having been sunk and then refloated. Looking at the guns and the empty cabin, Stephen says, I think slightly critically, slightly snappishly here, I can't think. I can't conceive what you hope to gain by placing them there and ruining our parlour. Our music room, our one solace on the ocean's bosom, but then I am no great sailor. And, and, and Jack is very, very inclined to be generous to his friend. Oh, I should never say that. Oh, not at all. Not really. But if you like, I will explain them by telling you about my plan of attack. If anything that depends on one probable surmise but countless unknowns can be called a plan. I should be very happy to hear it, says Stephen. And I, my, in, in, in my hearing of this, in my... In my mind's ear, Stephen's really not all that happy to hear it, but he's willing to kind of humor Jack here. Right, right. Especially after he, he's just really dissed him for, uh, you know, taking out those little short carronades that were so nice, made so much room in the cabin, then taking out everything and sticking in these big chasers. What's going on here? Yeah. Well, Jack explains that, you know, he hopes to catch the, the French watering on the south side of the island, that, you know, the nutmeg will come in absolutely looking like this Dutch merchantman in need of water. And what he's hoping is that they can get right alongside the French ship, raise the ensign, give her a broadside and border in the smoke. And with the men that the French will have ashore collecting water, the numbers should be about even. Now, if this doesn't work, Jack says, we really cannot engage her from a distance. You know, her long 18-pounders against the nutmegs carinag is, is not going to work. So if it doesn't work, Jack hopes to entice her and, you know, and get her to follow him out. Thinking with the French so short of stores, you know, they're going to be salivating at this man of war that looks like it's got, you know, it's it's got everything that they need here. So Jack's Having talked to the master of the Dutch ship, is sure that he can outsail the Cornelie by and large. Mm. And what he's going to try to do is make the Cornelie think that the nutmeg is trying to escape, lead her through the Salababu passage by night. And by night is critical because what he wants to do is he's going to disappear behind the second island at the far end of the passage while the French follow a well-lit boat ahead. Oh, like you said, Ian, we're hearing lots of themes from yeah. past Jack Deception, these capers. I love it. You know, and then when the French pass, Jack's going to come right out from behind him. They'll have the weather gauge. And, you know, he thinks that they should be able to lay the French alongside in a glass or two. So, so you know, within it, an, half an hour to an hour, boom, you know, we should have her. And it's, it's a really elaborate plan, but it's got all those hallmarks of these little like you say, these little capers of Jack Aubrey's that make you think he could just about pull this off. Right. It's so well set up that he could just about pull it off. And Stephen wonders then if this chase is going to take all night. And and Jack, I hope he's grasping a belaying pin as he says this. He says, the passage is well-known deep water. The French captain is bold and enterprising because he's the one that she heaved his ship down in Pulo Prabang. He's desperately short of stores so much that they took almost worthless sailcloth from the Dutchman Alkmaar. Given the long journey that the Connolly has in front of him, he'll risk almost anything to seize a well-provisioned man of war. 
Jack plans to go through the passage to get home so the chase benefits him. And that's why Jack has put the chasers into the cabin. He wants to be able to return fire if they have to pretend to flee and entice them to chase. There's always the chance of a lucky shot from Jack's nine-pounders, and he talks a little bit about how that sometimes happened in the past, and it can turn a battle. And of course, there's always a chance of a lucky shot from the French, who sometimes point their guns as well. That's Jack appealing to fate there, making sure that he's not tempting her too much. And Stephen's still on about, will this take all night? Are you sure this sounds like a very long, drawn-out process? How long can the French fire, he says, if they only have these four barrels of powder that we heard earlier on that they'd taken? And he sees Jack's reaction. We don't really hear Jack's first reaction, but Stephen sees it and regrets straight away. And Jack then turns very cold and says they'd have 120 shots from a nine-pound chaser or four 18 18-pounder broad, broadsides if the bow gun is left out. So Jack is very sure that if he engages, and he, he depends really on knowing that if he engages, this is going to be a fair fight. And he kind of resents the implication from Stephen that Jack might be pouncing on an enemy that's really not prepared to slug it out. Yeah, and, and I think Stephen's doing the other way. He's sort of thinking, all right, let's 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 win this thing, right? Let's, yeah. let's, not, <laughs> let's not stop here, right? Yeah. Well, Fielding comes in and he reports that after a certain amount of reluctance, you know, all hands have now done a really good job, perhaps too good a job of, of you know, really abominating the ship here. And that now he's having to discourage them from making the ship look even worse. O'Brien writes, a proper rag fair she looks forward. Irish pennants slush over the side. The head's enough to make a madhouse blush. And uh, Jack and Stephen say, you know, hey, let's go up and see it. And on deck, Stephen looks around. And he says, well, well, where should I look to see what they've done? And, and Fielding and Jack cry <laughs> everywhere, you know. And, and, and Stephen says, well, it kind of looks the same to me. And, and, you know, everybody is sort of aghast at this here. And, and Jack and Fielding are trying to point out some of the things that are different and out of place. And Stephen, you know, eager to please, says, well, you know, I, I, I do see that spot on that one sail over there. I, I don't think that was there before. And, you know, and, and maybe the whole sail itself is perhaps a little less bright than usual. And he can he sees that the crew is not happy as well. <laughs> and so he excuses himself to head for somewhere where, as he says, he's more competent to judge. <laughs> Uh, he asks if Jack would like to accompany him on his morning rounds, which Jack usually does, you know, goes to the sick bay to see everybody. But Jack excuses himself today. And then he says that Stephen was probably a little misled because they they still haven't shifted all the other sails. And he says it's going to be clearer to Stephen after dinner, you know, the changes in the ship here. So I was like, ah, Jack, thank you for trying to cover for Stephen and help Stephen feel a little bit better and maybe have the crew not want to hang him <laughs> so much. The change, however, does become much more evident even before dinner. Even the most unobservant eye can tell the difference in the ship. After the noon observation, the hands are sent to dinner. Stephen sees Jack and the master exchanging nods on deck, which means they're making good time and they're on the right parallel. They're on the right track. And during dinner, Jack is try trying to coax Stephen back into friendly discussion of what's going on here. He asks if he understands that all of this is only provisional in the event that the Cornelly has done exactly what Jack wants her to have done. And Stephen graciously smiles and nods, says, I do understand how the evil eye can be attempted to be averted. And Stephen's saying that Jack is really only saying this to tempt fate. He's not buying into any of this belaying pin grasping that Jack is trying to do here. He's still got a bit of a cold view, I think, of what Jack's doing. Jack says that they must raise the island at first light so they can see if the French are there. And Mike, this is a, we're raising the complexity of this little plan here that Jack has to kind of trip over the Cornelie half by accident and then let her chase them. This, this chase has to include coming across them at first light so that the French can actually see before this whole, you know, lanterns on a boat trick can be made to happen in the following darkness. Jack is pretty sure that they can raise the island at first light. And Stephen says he'll be sure to wake Welby, the Marine officer who sleeps in the cabin next to his at four bells. Once they've finally seen the Cornelie and they're sure that it's her, they strike down their top gallant masts, which reduces their profile so they don't get seen, dip below the horizon and prepare to come in at a leisurely pace under their topsails. He has to get the timing of enticing her out just right. It has to be just after noon. If they're going to do that, they need to be sure that they run through the passage at night and then a time so that they can hide behind the island in the dark. Once again, it's a complex manoeuvre with lots of timing involved here. 
Jack asks Stephen if he understands the importance of the weather gauge. And Mike, Jack has been checking in on Stephen's understanding of the weather gauge since about chapter three of Master and Commander. Right. And what, surely he understands now that Stephen's a here today, gone tomorrow kind of a guy when it comes to retaining this kind of information. Stephen replies, it would be strange if the weather gauge had to be explained to so old a sea dog, he's meaning himself here, though I must confess there was a time when I was confused with that thing which creaks on the roof, showing which way the wind is blowing, he's talking about the weather vane. Stephen asks if there isn't some other way to obtain this valuable gauge, this weather advantage, without running 100 miles and hiding behind a mythical island. Jack explains that there is not another way to obtain the weather gauge. A anything that doesn't involve a stern chase involves being exposed to the Cornelis broadside. The island is not mythical. It's well plotted on the charts. But even so, says the text, let us hope that the first plan of running in and boarding her straight away comes to root. That is to say, he paused, frowning. R drum roll for an Aubreyism here. Right. Rules the roost? No. No. Takes fruit? Oh, oh, be damned to it. The trouble with you, Stephen, if you do not mind me saying so, is that although you are the best linguist I was ever shipmates with, like the Pope of Rome that spoke a hundred languages, Pentecost come again. And Stephen interrupts and says, would it be Maglia Becci that you have in mind? I, I dare say, a foreigner in any case, and I am sure you speak quite as many and like a native or better, but English is not one of them. You do not get figures quite right, and now you have put the word clean out of my head. And my, Jack's cool and his goodwill and his willingness to, to, to humor Stephen's completely broken down. He's, he's not happy with Stephen poking fun at all the Aubreyisms here, but he is playing Jack the Scholar a little bit with his reference to Antonio Magliabecci. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. What, what do we know about this person? Well, this is, this is a guy who, who lived from 1633 to 1714. He, he was not a Pope of Rome who spoke 100 languages, but he was an Italian scholar librarian and bibliophile. It was interesting. He was like, until he was 40, he was an apprentice goldsmith, but he would take all of his extra money and buy books and manuscripts. And he, and he, unlike many people who collect, he read every one of them. He just loved them. And one of the, the librarian to the Cardinal de' Medici, so, you know, de' Medici were in Florence here, recognizes this guy's ability and teaches him Latin and Greek and Hebrew and then he becomes, you know, this guy becomes, you know, going from a goldsmith's apprentice to the librarian of the Medici library, you know, the Grand Duke of Tuscany at the time. And he becomes this central figure in the life of literary life in, in Florence. So the scholars from all these other nations, you know, they, they come to make his acquaintance, they correspond with him. And he's said to have known basically everything in his 40,000 books and his 10,000 manuscripts, like, you know, page, chapter, and verse. He has this unbelievable memory. At the same time, he completely negligent of day-to-day -day things, sleeps in his clothes. They kind of wears them until they fall off of him. He eats like three hard-boiled eggs a day and a little bit of water, completely negligent of worldly matters. You know, you get almost like an Einstein taken to the nth level here. Mm. Uh, but, you know, and you can kind of see where this would be a guy that Stephen loves too. Yeah, you know, he loved yeah. all this knowledge and everything. And upon his death, his fortune went to the poor and his books were combined with the Grand Dukes to become the National uh, Central Library of Florence. So a public library. Fascinating. Wow. Fa you know, and here's O'Brien with books and literature and his knowledge. So it's like, what a great figure to, would it be? Yeah, yeah. yeah it would. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. <laughs> Well, this, uh, this this guy, the old sea dog, this is this is Stephen we're talking about here. The old sea dog, it says in the text, appeared on deck next day at dawn, looking as some other old dogs do when they are roused untimely from their pad, uncombed, unbrushed, matted. He was not exceptional. Nearly all the officers were in their oldest working clothes, and some had been up much longer. And we we get this nice picture. Again, it's a little bit of a an image that we're carrying in our minds from the Master and Commander movie as well, of the ship all kind of messed up and the people on deck all wearing their working clothes too. Everyone's got their eyes on the lookout. Remember, we started the chapter with the lookout, the midshipmen at the masthead. I think now they've got their eyes on the regular lookout who's watching the approaching island. They're standing in silence as the sunlight moves down the southwest side of Nil Desperandum. 
By the way, Mike, I love this little moment here because timing is critical to this whole thing. This chapter and next chapter is all about timing and progress. And we get this little hint of it, as we say, they noticed the shadow and the pattern of the sun moving down the side of the island. We get this sense of time slowly passing. All of this scholarly contemplative mood is completely fractured by O'Brien's next line, which says, Warren, the master, uttered a thundering fart. No one smiled, frowned, or took his eyes from the masthead. <laughs> I might, this line gets mentioned from time to time. Um, I think our listener, Jonathan Birch, had mentioned it on the Lubber's Soul Facebook page. Thank you, Jonathan. And also post about it on the uh, Aubrey Matcher and Appreciation Society Facebook page. Fart jokes. We, we love them. They're absolutely part of the spine of, of O'Brien's humor here. Right. Being fed horses or not, right? <laughs> Indeed. Well, the lookout is reporting a ship, a ship that he sees yards across, meaning the yards are ready to be to, to have sails set upon them, half a mile from shore. Jack gets the ship out of sight of land by kind of hiding behind the headland there, has the extra sails furled messily, again, going with this idea of making the ship look slovenly like a merchantman. The crew starts painting the false gun ports that merchantmen often hang on their sides to deter pirates. And in this case, they're going to hide the nutmeg's actual gun ports. And we've been here before painting cloths to go on the side. And we know that Stephen's a liability around a deck with cloth and painting. So he has Bondon stop the work momentarily so that he, Stephen, can be walked to the ladder and get out of the way. And down in the all we find that Stephen's not the only one who's a bit of a liability around paint. Macmillan, his assistant, is down there trying to get paint out of his trousers where he'd walked past the other painting crew. And I think they're both kind of shaking their heads at the, the, the bizarre behavior of seamen. They talk about the extraordinary zeal of seamen in any faintly illegitimate and deceptive ploy. <laughs> faintly illegitimate is a, is a small version of what Stephen's thinking right now, I think. Right. Stephen notes that the ordinary work of the ship goes on just the same and predicts that despite all of this extra special disguising that's going on, the hands will still be eating the nearly edible heated salt pork by eight bells in that watch. They go into the sixth berth to check the patients um, and they they change to Latin to discuss them. So, you know, so they can talk confidentially, which O'Brien tells us the patients love because it's not just some, you know, you know, some sawbones with them. This is this is somebody that talks foreign that uh, really knows their stuff here. Uh, and there's one patient who has what uh, O'Brien tells us is known as the Marthambles, Marthambles at sea and the griping of the guts by land. Um, and we've I think we've heard this before. And it's this kind of the condition that, you know, Macmillan says, you know, he's, he's likely to be dead within the hour. Stephen confirms the diagnosis. And, and Stephen says, you know, he's really upset a little bit that there's never anything he can do for these patients. He can just treat their symptoms. And he says to Macmillan, you know, I would really love to open him up to learn more about this disease. He wants to do an autopsy and say, I'd like to find out what's going on here so we know more what to do. Macmillan agrees. This is a great idea. And Macmillan says, and this is the perfect man. He has no messmates. He has no friends that would object. You know, he was kind of on his own here in the ship and only his, you know, his, you know, the captain and his divisional commander would come see him. Nobody else came to see him. So perfect for an autopsy here. The breeze dies down and Jack advances his plan by an hour. He's thinking, OK, like you were saying, and timing's important here. And turns out that Stephen's prediction about the salt pork is mistaken. It's ah. eaten raw inside at six bells, not outside heated at eight bells here. So, you know, the hands don't mind, you know, they're in that state of enhanced feelings, you know, so common to the hour before a heated action. And, you know, they're eating and the ones who are to stay below as they sail in are teasing the ones who are dressed like Dutchmen and are going to be allowed <laughs> to be on deck. And and we hear this, you know, off repeated O'Brien, uh, you know, insult here. Uh, the hands are saying there's some slab sided Dutch built buggers that are allowed to show themselves. Right. Because why? Because they look so harmless. Nobody would be frightened of them. A maid would not be frightened of them. Ha -ha, not even a wife would be frightened of them. Well, you know, after that conversation about moral advantage, O'Brien wants to sort of bring us down a bit here. But, uh, you know, I, I think I, I can't remember if we've heard slab sided Dutch built buggers referring to people before. But here it is. Very good. It's, it's a classic canon insult. I mean, that's 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 a Patrick O'Brien fridge magnet insult if ever I heard one. Absolutely. <laughs> 
Well, S- Stephen notices. Remember, I've got Stephen pegged in my mind here as being on a slightly chippy, slightly sort of sarcastic, surly note all the way through this chapter. And he notices, uh, maybe f- by difference from himself, just how cheerful the members of the crew are. He heads on deck to ask Jack if they'll have time for this autopsy that he has planned before the battle begins. However, he sees, he can observe that they're well in with the land. There's not going to be time. Jack points out the French frigate, the Cornelie, to Stephen and tells him that the tide is full, invites him to grab a sandwich and some coffee from the quarter gallery since dinner will be late with the galley fires going out for some time. Jack goes on and explains he doesn't expect action for another hour unless the French should happen to recognise the trick before then. There are these reefs in the water, these separate independent reefs that make navigating difficult, and Jack shows Stephen the watering party ashore through his telescope. Stephen asks if he can look at the Cornelie herself, and Jack suggests that he do so from the sash light in the quarter gallery rather than from the quarter deck. And he's thinking, you know, don't want anybody looking through a telescope appearing to be surveilling to be visible um, on the deck of the nutmeg here. Jack asks Stephen to look for Pierrot, Christy Pallier's boy, and Stephen reminds Jack that he's never seen Pierrot. And, and again, a nice little moment of Jack and his appreciation of the, the kindness and the gentility of the connections that he's had with the French before. And he really doesn't want to have to face down in action and know that he's facing down in action, this friendly young guy, Piero. They sail on into the channel, trying to get to the two dog legs half a mile apart so they can run in under the Cornelis Lee. And this is all tricky navigation, close in shore with reefs and whilst trying to look slovenly like a merchantman. Richardson is up on the yard conning the ship, watching for the dark blue water of the channel. And meanwhile, most of the crew are hidden. That includes the gun crews. They're at their stations with slow match. The boarders have got their weapons at hand. Stephen, from where he's at in the captain's washing, shaving and powdering station and the, the little privy there, he has a perfect view. He's watching the French when he can as they go through the dog legs. And as they get to the second dog leg, a signal breaks out on the French ship's masthead, followed by a gun from the quarter deck. And it seems like the French are pretty close to smoking what's going on here. By now, the nutmeg's close enough that they can see the French frigate running out her 18-pounders. They can see that without a telescope. The Cornelie is right there in front of them, broadside on. French colours run up, but no warning shot. Three 18-pounders are fired with killing intent. They've pierced the disguise. Jack calls for all hands, hoping to get close enough to engage with real effect. Remember, he's armed with the the short range, the 32-pound carronades. He tells the crew to raise the ensign and the pennant, take off the painted strips. Seymour comes in to tell Stephen that Jack would like him to go below. And Mike, action is joined. Within a couple of sentences, we're right in the midst of the action here. We are, we are, and and you know, like you said, Ian, you know, there's no warning shot. There's nothing across their bow. I mean, something has said, you know, they're they're certain that this is jeopardy, and they fire the rest of their broadside in sequence, and all of a sudden you got these holes appearing in the nutmegs, topsails, and courses. You know, the tack of the mainsail springs free, and the last shot shatters the larboard cathead. Jack observes good practice for such a distance, and Fielding says, "Very credible, sir." I wish it may not improve, however. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, yeah they're, they're shooting as well as we need them to. Yeah, in the next pause, the nutmeg comes 200 yards closer, and the French Lorbert guns start firing very deliberately here. You know, six balls hit the nutmeg's hull or, or their masts or their yards. One carries away half the Lorbert quarter gallery, and the 16th comes the length of the ship at chest height killing two men on the forecastle and three on the quarterdeck. One of them is Miller, who's standing right next to Jack. Mm. You know, he's got his hand on the wheel. And the other that gets, one of the others that gets killed is the master. So here we've got, you know, we remember Jack's concern about the bad luck of promoting these guys to midshipmen. And so this comes true for Miller. Now, Oaks, Oaks is still alive at the moment here. And it's a terrible moment. You know, once again, O'Brien really shocks us. With, with the death of a young young character, a young crew member. It's a really sad moment. It's gone in the blink of an eye. And we've hardly had time, first of all, to get to know the kid. And second of all, hardly had time to process what Jack was saying before, Mike, as you said about the, the riskiness of being around on the quarterdeck. 
So yeah. this guy that was opening the chapter, you know, yeah. with such admiration for Jack is now boom, dead beside him. Yeah. Good. And, and in an even more immediate kind of first person grisly moment here, Jack wipes Miller's blood from his own face. This is how close they were and orders a fast turn to starboard. He orders the crew to fire at the right moment. He says, fire as they bear. And the nut makes 32 pound carronade. These short range heavyweight weapons start to fire. Bond and carries Harper, who's wounded, into the sick berth and tells them in the sick berth, we're slogging it out, sir. A pleasure to see. The nut makes firing twice as fast as the French and into the wind, so their smoke blows away instantly and they can see where their shot falls. However, aiming high, their shots are wild and aiming low, their shots fall short. The cornerly, although slow, is, we learn, shockingly accurate. It turns out she is not husbanding her gunpowder. Oh, no, they're not just down to four barrels. They're not short of powder. This speculation that Jack and Stephen had turns out not to pay off. The French have got powder and to spare for this action. Looks like Jack was right all along to be cautious about how this might play out. Jack wears the ship to try to bring his chasers into action. And and sure enough, they get three shots each, at least two of which go home. Uh, the Cornelie, in the, in the meantime, fires two broadsides, one of which would actually have dismasted the nutmeg if the nutmeg hadn't turned so hard. The second shot falls short. And the text says, if they had fired as quick as they fired straight, reflected Jack, we should have been hard up at a clinch with no knife to cut the seizing. Jack sees that the Cornelie is is having a problem winning her anchor. And Fielding says, yeah, and they're having no better luck with their longboat. He points out that it's gotten stuck in a small reef a quarter of the mile from shore, wedged on a falling tide. Jack looks over to see this, and he's delighted to see that the officer on the skiff, attempt, you know, who's directing the attempts to unload the water cast to refloat the boat, is Christy Pallier's boy. So it's like, ah, oh, oh, good. He's not on the ship. I couldn't have killed him here. And uh, Jack's thinking, okay, we really need to get the Cornelie going soon. And we need to get going soon because we don't have much time to spare. We're back to that timing here. Mr. Walker comes by, reports a foot of water in the well, and three holes uh, comfortably plugged. However, he says, the launch and the spars on either side suffered and the captain's larboard stern gallery is well nigh wrecked. So part of Jack wow. and Stephen's home is uh, is gone at this point. Yeah, yeah, and a good thing Stephen's gone below into the uh, into the surgeon's yes. berth by this point. Yeah, good point. Ian. Well, I, I love that Jack is back on good terms with Fielding. Not that they were ever on bad terms, but I kind of got the impression that Fielding was a bit wanting to husband the ship and her prettiness. But now they're in fighting mode. Jack has Fielding move them out into the fairway with a stage over the side as if they were in danger of foundering. He can put everyone to knotting and splicing while six hands make a show of setting up and using this stage. They pump out on the far side so that the French can't see what they're pumping out. Jack's clerk, Adams, reports that he's made notes, but it is very kind of dainty, delicate, odd little bit of formality here. He says... We never beat to quarters, so it's not an official action. So what do I do with my notes? <laughs> I love the fact that the fact that they didn't beat to quarters means that it's not really a fight. Since, therefore, the people who've died in this exchange of gunfire were not killed in action formally, he asks that they get sewn up in the hammocks rather than just dumped over the side. So actually, yeah, a little bit of civility towards um, the bodies of the men who've died here. Down in the Orlop, Stephen reports the butcher's bill three dead from splinter wounds, six other injuries that he describes as in a good way with the blessing. And Jack tells him that up on deck, the master, young Miller, Gray, and two more on the forecastle had all died from the same shot, one shot raking along the length of the ship. Jack reported to the patients waiting in the sick bay there that the French could hit them hard and they could hardly hit her at all. And Harper says, well, my gun crew hulled the French twice. I saw it with my own eyes. And Jack says, I'm sure you did. But now we mean to lead her on, lie in wait at the end of the passage and engage her at close quarters. She's fouled her anchor and her longboat is aground at present. But I dare say everything will be in order within an hour and we can wait an hour. Ooh. End of chapter five. Wow. Wow. You know, it, it's interesting. Gosh, you, you mentioned we were talking earlier 
you know, we're kind of right in the middle of the action and boom, the, the curtain comes down on the chapter. It's like, whoa, but I guess, I guess there's a little pause. Yeah. And it, it, you're right. He, he does very often write actions, you know, in, in a standalone chapter, we get straight to the, 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 the payoff and the quiet and the reflection at the end of the fighting. But now, like you say, we've hit pause. It was never really the aim, of course, to take the ship in this action. It was the aim to engage with her and then draw her away. And now we're left thinking, okay, well, both ships seem to have sustained some damage. And the midshipman there is claiming that we hold the friendship. We know for sure that the nutmeg got hold and more from the French right. gunnery. It turns out that they weren't caught short. They weren't badly trained. They weren't off guard. They weren't short of powder. They were resourceful and they handled the ship well. And there's there's nothing about this that says to me that Jack's plan is guaranteed to come off. And Mike, we've had quite a few clues already about this, the sensitivity around time, which I think leaves us with a bit of jeopardy here as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm remembering back to Jack saying, well, remember, Stephen, let's just hope that it all ends there on the island, you know, and then we won't have to go through this whole long thing that Stephen was you know, kind of objecting to. But, you know, now, even though the first part didn't go as he planned or hoped it would, you know, he hopes that he can lure them out into this chase at night, as you said, Ian, this very time sensitive one. And, and the action, you know, it's moved ahead in the chapter. We've had some incredibly fascinating character observations. We've had some great Patrick O'Brien humor. Yeah. We've yeah. had some foreshadowing paid off with Miller's death. And perhaps, you know, this loss of disguise a little bit too early. Was that part of the albatross cuttlebone foreshadow? Is that cuttlebone mm. foreshadow yet to pay out some more? I don't know here. Yeah, we, we, we've had time up close with Stephen as well, in a way, thinking about his mental and emotional and familial journey at the same time as we're journeying along with Jack and the nutmeg and chasing the Cornelie. Uh, not to mention this continuing journey and the, and the, let's call it banter, this slight tension that we've had, a needle, maybe you would call it, in this last chapter between Jack and Stephen. It's really interesting, isn't it, that Jack didn't react a bit more when Stephen had complained about Jack ruining their parlor and their music place. Something's got Stephen on edge. Jack so far has been very willing to just kind of bat that away. It was really nice how Jack covered for Stephen not seeing all of the slovenliness for, for the midshipman set up there. I love how, you know, his friendship was enough to say, I'm going to let Stephen go with this, even though everybody else was shaking their heads. Right. And so, so Mike, that leaves us wondering what, what happens next. Yeah. I mean, did the French get their act together? Do they come after the nutmeg? This first act didn't go as planned. What happens in the next act? Are we going to get this cat and mouse chase right here? We're going to have to wait for the payoff. There's a part of me that wants to say, well, what about South America? I think I've been saying that for how many books now? Yeah, here? Yeah. But, but now, I don't, for some crazy reason, I'm sitting here worrying about the loss of another ship. I mean, yeah. you know, there's so many things that kind of have repeated in the canon. I'm going, oh my gosh, they're not going to get sunk here in the nutmeg, are they? No, please, not again, not again. But whatever happens... I want to be there. Well, in, in that case, Mike, since we both want to be there, what do you say next week to just a little more Patrick O'Brien? Oh, as Stephen said early, I would like that of all things. Although I think he said, with all my heart. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat in its beak keeping company with the ship sorry sam you can delete keeping company with the ship yeah so. i just realized that god we've got to get a better writer <laughs> <laughs> sorry